<laughs> thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. And it's good to see each and every one of you. Welcome again to, uh, to the tab here today. We have been in a series of messages throughout the month of March entitled Hope. And uh, how many of you would agree that there is no shortage of people who need hope today in our world? Amen. And uh, we believe that there is hope and uh, we can know hope. Uh, hope isn't just a, a concept or an idea, it's something that we can, can know and, uh, and experience personally in each and every one of our hearts and lives. We've defined hope as uh, that which we believe, desire, rely, and trust upon in life. And there are a great many of things that people put their hope in, amen? Uh, people put their hope in in one another, in maybe parents or friendships or relationships, a spouse, put their hope in their, their employer uh, or their employees, whatever. Uh, and and that's, that's all fine and well, but, uh, but all of those, all of the things in this world uh, are really not the, uh, the bedrock of, of hope. Uh, hope is found in none other than Jesus Christ, amen? And uh, hope is the belief that uh, what is wanted also can be uh, obtained, had, or experienced, or that events will turn out for the best. And that's really, uh, I believe, a wonderful definition of the word hope. Hope is also a verb and a noun. It's something that we do, but it's also someone that we believe in. And so our hope has a source. Uh, our hope has an object, and that object uh, according to the psalmist, I love Psalm 25, verse 5, said this, My hope is in God. So he is the source and he is the object of our hope. And uh, if that is your hope today, you're in, you're in, good, uh, you're in good position uh, this morning. The psalmist goes on to say in, uh, in Psalm 31, verse 24, Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. So there's this wonderful dynamic that takes place when we as people put our hope in God. All of a sudden, strength comes to our hearts. Uh, power comes to our spirits and our souls. Uh, I will never forget many years ago when I was uh, in school and we had to do clinicals and uh, we could do you know, clinicals in a great many of settings and I decided I thought I would do a, a clinical one semester as a hospital chaplain. And we were assigned floors for a week. We would go and we would make calls on people and talk to them and minister to them and pray with them. That's what we would do. And, and uh, in, throughout the, the semester, we, we were on every floor of the hospital multiple times. And I'll never forget one time uh, I was assigned one week to the cancer floor. And uh, how many of you know everybody in every room needed hope? <laughs> if you've got cancer, you're dying of cancer. You need hope. And uh, I was ministering to a... Uh, a middle-aged lady, I would say probably in her 50s, and she was full of cancer. And uh, I'd just sit and visit with her and just give her hope, just, just keep pointing her towards the source of hope, Jesus Christ. And, and uh, boy, by the time I left, her spirits were up and she was filled with strength. She still had cancer, but something had changed. Something had shifted in her soul uh, because, of, because of her hope was then in the Lord. And a couple days passed, and I came back to her room, and uh, there was a person exiting as I was entering, and didn't know this person. I walked into the room expecting to find this same happy, cheerful, hope-filled woman that I left two days ago. And uh, it was the complete opposite. She was crying, her head was down, she was depressed. And I said, what happened? What happened to you? And uh, she pointed to the door, and she said, that person just took my hope. That person just took my hope. And it, it just, it was like a balloon. The air just went out from her. And I made a decision right then and there that I was never going to take someone's hope. Ever. Ever, 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 ever. Uh, I was going to instill hope. I don't care if I had to bury him the next day. I was going to instill hope in them. And, uh, and, and I made that decision. I can take you to the hospital tile floor where I made that. I said, I'm never, ne no one's ever going to say that about Timothy James Farrell. Going to point at me and say that person took my hope. How, how sad that is. And you know what, Christians? We need to be people of what? 
of hope and instilling hope in one another. Because all things are possible through who? Through Jesus Christ. Amen. And, uh, and if we have hope, we have strength. And I love it. The psalmist says, why then, uh, soul, are you so downcast? Why are you so disturbed? Because your hope is in God, right? And if you'll put your hope in God, you'll what? You'll yet praise him, your God and your Savior. In other words, God has a way of turning things around and working things out for our good. Our God is a miracle worker, amen? And uh, can I have a, a better amen, amen? And he's a way maker. That's the great thing about our God. He can make a way when there no, doesn't seem to be a way. I mean, it's just wonderful. I mean, the Bible's filled with illustration after illustration, time after time after time, where God came through for his people. I'm just thinking of one, one illustration right now before I get into my message. I'm just warming up my engine here, by the way. I'm thinking about Moses standing at the shore of the Red Sea. He's got three million people bickering and ready to throw him off the cliff, right? And uh, Pharaoh's armies are coming up from behind. The Red Sea's before him. And that looked like a kind of hopeless situation. I mean, he was probably, and they didn't have a weapon. All right, and here's the army of Egypt. At the time, it was the world power. It was the world military power. And uh, they started screaming. I mean, they, they, I'm sure, had a board meeting to oust the leader, all right? You know, fire the pastor. And, and you know what Moses did? Moses looked up to God. He said, boy, I, is, my hope is in God. God, what do we do? God told him to raise up his staff. And he was going to perform what a miracle. He parted the Red Sea. That's a miracle in itself. It's the greatest miracle, I think, was he dried the land. He dried the land. He dried the mud clay, and they went around. They went across all three million of them. Not one person was lost. Matter of fact, the Pharaoh and the armies of Egypt followed them into, into the Red Sea, and once the last person crossed uh, the sea, the sea came crashing down on the enemies of the, of the Israelites. Isn't that wonderful? So that's just one example, that God can do the impossible. So regardless of what you're facing today, you might be facing a Red Sea. You might be looking at your situation and saying, there's no way. Well, let me tell you, there is a way. There's a way, there's always a way when you've got God as your hope. And uh, so today, we're wanting to, uh, to look at hope for, uh, for troubled children. Hope for troubled children, or we could say troubled teenagers. Many children living in our world today are troubled. Uh, children are troubled physically, troubled emotionally, mentally, relationally, uh, and spiritually today. Uh, more children are on prescription medications, seeing psychological counsels, counselors and physical doctors in this generation than in any other generation. It's amazing. Why is that? Because they're troubled. Our children are troubled. Our teens are troubled. The word troubled is defined as this. Look at this with me. It means to be agitated, to be disturbed, to be worried, afflicted, vexed, and in pain. Well, I know a lot of children, I know a lot of teenagers who what? Who probably meet, meet, meet I should say, that description, that definition. They're agitated, they're disturbed, they're worried uh, emotionally, mentally, afflicted, physically, vexed in their hearts. And, and the manifestation many times will, will affect them physically. We know that, uh, that what you uh, live with long enough in your soul or in your spirit will affect you physically. It just will. And so it can manifest as, as, as you know, pain in your neck and in your back and you just, you, all this stuff. They're, they're troubled. They're troubled. Children today are experiencing, encountering, and having to deal with things previous generations never had to. It's almost as if those youngest among us have been targeted by the most evil among us. It's almost as if the enemy of our souls has chosen to focus his attention not only on us as adults, but also on our children and our teenagers. Now, I don't know about you, but that makes me angry. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. I, I, I get angry when adults get get uh, targeted by the enemy but I really get angry when innocent children are targeted by by the most evil and wicked among us uh, there's something that really can get me into the flesh really quick all right 
so you need to pray for me. And, uh, uh, and if, you, if you are a parent, you know what I'm talking about. It's kind of like that mother bear. You can pick on the mama bear, but don't pick on her cubs. You pick on her cubs, it's, it's all bets off. It's all bets off. And some of we got some mama bears in here. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Don't mess with me. You can mess with me, but don't mess with my kiddos and don't, wet, don't mess with my grandkids. Amen? Or, or great grandkids. I mean, you, you know, you go to hurting them and it's, it's all bets off. And, and, and that's, that's what I'm talking about here today. Is, is It's one thing for the enemy to attack us as adults. And he will. And we're going to talk about that. But he's going after our children. He's going after our kids. He's going after your, your grandkids. He just is. Now, uh, our enemy is real. Uh, we have an enemy. Our relationships have an enemy. Our marriages have an enemy. And our children and grandchildren have an enemy. Our enemy, listen to this, is merciless. Our enemy is fearless, ferocious, and he is out to steal, kill, and destroy each and every one of our lives. The devil has a plan. The devil has a plan for you and your children. And uh, the enemy has, a, has so attacked and targeted our children, think about this, that we have created and made entire hospitals only for children. We call them children's hospitals. I mean, just a generation before, we didn't have children's hospitals. Think about that. We have entire hospitals, and they're packed out. I'm getting angry. That makes me angry. That, 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 and, and when we went and saw a movie yesterday, it's a great movie, and I would highly recommend it to every one of you, uh, Miracles from Heaven. It's about a child, a 10-year-old child, uh, that, that's attacked and vexed and troubled. And it's, I take, take your tissues with you, by the way. I mean, from beginning to end, you're going to cry. And uh, uh, it, it's a powerful, and it just, it just it, it brings up righteous anger, by the way. I mean, it's that righteous anger that Jesus had when he, you know, cleaned out the temple. There's, there's righteous anger. And we can be angry at the devil. You can hate someone. Hate the devil. Love your enemy, but hate the devil. All right? Love people, but hate the devil. Uh, the devil has plans for you and for your child. What are they? Well, look at this with me. Uh, 1 Peter 5, verse 8 says this. Your enemy, the devil, all right, so he's been identified, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking for someone to what? To devour, to eat, to bite into, to trouble, to vex, to agitate, to irritate, right? And he'll just, he, and he's looking around. Who, who, can, I, who can I pick on? Who, who can I get to? Oh, there, I'm going to go. And that's what he's doing. Look at this with me. Uh, Ephesians 6, 11 through 12 says, Take your stand against what? The devil's schemes. Your enemy, think about this, is scheming and plotting and planning your children's destruction. Well, that's humbling, isn't it? Not just yours, your children. For our struggle, Paul says, is not against what? Flesh and blood. It's not against people. Our struggle isn't against one another, but it's against what? Rulers and authorities, against powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil or wickedness in heavenly places. Jesus said it this way in John 10, 10, the thief comes only, but to what? Steal, kill, and to destroy. In other words, uh, you don't want to play with the, you don't want to play with the devil. Matter of fact, uh, one of the images uh, of, of Satan is a snake. Right? He came to Adam and Eve as a snake. You don't, you don't go to bed with a snake. You don't, you know, you gotta, you gotta watch yourself because snakes will bite. And you don't want to play, if you say, oh, I can play a little, I can play around with the devil. I can do this and I can do that. You might play around, with, but just beware, he's going to bite you. He's gonna, that's, it, that's only what he's there for. He, he, he might not bite you on day one, but on day 100, he's going to, he's going to bite you. And he's got plans to to steal, kill, and destroy your life. Now, here's the good news. God, your creator and savior, has plans to what? Prosper and protect you and your children. The devil is out to get you and your children. God is out to bless you and your children. The devil is out to take from you and your children. God is out to bring you and your children uh, in. The devil is out to ruin your child's life, and God's out to bless your child's life. That's the God that we serve. The Lord's plans for your child have been defined for us in Jeremiah 29, verse 11. God says this, For I know the plans I have for you, 
Now, he's talking to, just again, context, he's not just talking to the adults. He's talking to all of Israel. He's talking to the teenagers. He's talking to the children. He's talking to the nursery, all right? He says, I've got plans for all of you, not just those of you that are adults. And what are God's plans for your child? Look at this, plans to prosper them, not to harm them. Isn't that good? God's not out to harm our kids. You've heard me say it once, and I'll say it again until people get it. God's not a child abuser. God's not, God's not a child abuser. God's a child blesser. God's a child, God's a child uh, uh, anointer. God's out to bless your, your children. Plans to give your children what? Hope. <laughs> right? Isn't that great? He comes to give us hope. And what? A future. And a future. I love that about God. Jesus said, I've come that you might have what? Life and have it more abundantly. Again, Jesus is talking to a crowd. He's not just talking to the adults here. He's talking to people of all ages and all races. So it's not just exclusive to American adults. It's, uh, it's all inclusive of every tribe, every tongue, every race, and every age. Jesus said, I've come to give you life. Isn't that wonderful? And to give it more abundantly. I love this. Matter of fact, God sent Jesus to destroy the devil. I love that about God. Acts 10 verse 38 says these words, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and he went around doing good, there it is, doing good, healing all who were under what? The power of the devil because God was with Jesus. So it's like God doesn't, so here's the thing, you need to get this straightened out in your theology. If it's not straightened out yet, we'll straighten it out right now. God is not the author of sickness. God is not the author of, 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 of pain and disease and illness. That's the other guy. God can't put something on you and then take something off of you. It's crazy. The devil's the one that puts all this stuff on us, and God sent Jesus Christ to take it off of us. Isn't that wonderful? God sent Jesus Christ to take off of you what the devil put on you, whatever it is. He came around doing good, healing all. I love that who are under the power of the devil. 1 John 3, 8 says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Isn't that good news? Jesus is out to destroy the devil's work, and so are we, Jesus' followers here today. John 16, says, in this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And that, I love that. You know, we're all going to experience trouble, trials, tribulation, tempest, and, and, uh, and storms in life. We all are. But that doesn't mean you have to be sunk by them, right? What do you do when a storm hits your life? You've got two options. You either sink or you surf. Surf the storm. Surf the storm. Jesus said, I've come that you might what? Have life and have it more abundantly. And I've come that you might what? That you might overcome the world. Isn't that great? I love that. Take heart. I've overcome the world. And when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, guess what? That lifts us up over whatever's coming against us. I want to share with you some action steps that we can take as adults, especially uh, when our children or our teenagers are targeted by our enemy. Because it is so many times children and, and even teenagers, they just don't know what to do. I mean, they're, they're, if they're saved, they're young in the Lord. And it is our responsibility as parents to build up the hedge, again, like that mama bear, all right? Uh, to protect our children. So what do we do and how can we do this when our children or our, uh, our children's children, our grandchildren or, or our nieces or nephews, all right, are attacked by the enemy? I want to share with you 12 action steps to take in times of trouble. Write these down, all right? 12 things we can do proactively at times where our children and teenagers are troubled. Number one is go to the Lord. Go to the Lord. So many times we go to the Lord last. We go to everybody else first. And there's, that's all right to go to other people. And I have nothing wrong, please hear me say, I have nothing wrong with counselors. I have nothing wrong with doctors. Thank God for them. Amen? If they're not out to hurt you, they're out there to help you. Okay, praise God for that. But go to the Lord. That's why I put that number one. Go to the Lord first. Psalm 91, 9 and 10 says, If you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you, and no disaster will come near your tent. And that's a conditional statement because it begins with the word if. That's if you what? 
If you make the Most High your dwelling. If you make your house God's house. If you make your family a Christian family. If you say, God, you, you, we, we, we give you our family. Th then, then we can lay claim to this, to this promise. Psalm 27, verse 5. For in the day of trouble, God will keep me safe in his what? Dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his what? Tabernacle. I love that. And set me high upon a rock. <laughs> Isn't that great? So in the day of trouble, when we go to the Lord, you know what he does? He comes around us like that mom, like that dad. And he, he stands in between us and the attack and the storm and the trouble and the tempest and the tribulation. And what? Doesn't just shelter us, but he what? He sets us high. He, he puts us above it, above the storm. That's our God. Psalm 9, 9 says, The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. See, God doesn't run away from you when you're in trouble. He runs to you. Any good parent worth their salt when their child says mommy or daddy doesn't go the other way. Right? They go where? They go to them. Especially when you get that. There's a different cry. I've, I've learned this from being a parent. There's just this, you know, daddy versus Daddy! You know, I mean, you know, you, you, and you, you know the voice, right? Well, when we go to our God and we say, Daddy, I'm in trouble, I mean, He responds. He responds to us. Why? Because He's good. He's a good God all the time. I love it. He's an ever-present help in times of trouble. So go to God. Psalm 32, 7. You are my hiding place, the psalmist writes. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. <laughs> so in the midst of the storm, you can sing. Isn't that wonderful? We can sing in the midst of the storm and praise God in the midst of the storm. It might be rain and hail uh, all around you and the thunder clashing, the lightning flashing all around you, and you, you, you're protected. It's not coming near you. Why? Because you've made God your hope. You put your hope in God and you as parents are building up a hedge, hedge of God's presence around your children if you go to the Lord. Secondly, action step number two, call upon the Lord. So you go to the Lord, but then you got to call on him. Psalm 87 says, in the day of my trouble, I will call you, upon you for you will answer me. Psalm 50 verse 15, call upon me, God says, in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you will honor me. So when you're going through the test, call upon God for deliverance and he'll give you a testimony. Everybody wants a testimony, amen? But no one wants to go through a test. If you never go through a test, all you have is a money. That's it. Oh, I want a great testimony, Pastor Tim. I want to, I want to be a witness for God, amen? I want, to, that's what, I want to honor God. I want to glorify God. Well, praise the Lord. Get ready. You're going to go through a test. But call upon God in the test. And he'll help you out. Then you say, look what God's done for me. Now, I wouldn't pray for tests. Don't pray for trouble. It's going it's, it's to find you, right? All right, you've got an enemy. He will find you. But don't, 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 again, don't get sunk by the storm. Call upon the Lord. Call upon the Lord in the day of your trouble. And we have a God, watch this, that'll answer us. Our God's not dead. Our God's alive. And he is well matter of fact, he holds the power over death, hell, and the grave. Everything is underneath his feet. And we are seated with Christ, according to Colossians 2, with him in heavenly places. We just need to claim our authority. We need to claim our position as children of God. Amen? Action step number three is pray to the Lord. Pray to the Lord. James 5, verse 13 says, Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. What do you do when trouble comes knocking on your door? You pray. When trouble hits your children, you pray. Matter of fact, don't just pray by yourself. We pray with our kids. When they get sick, we pray for them. We pray, I mean, we lay hands on them. We anoint them with oil. We give them the medicine. We, we pray to the Lord. God heal them. Amen. Amen. If they're sad, we pray about it. Uh, we, don't, we don't put up with that stuff. Luke 6, 28 says, pray for those who mistreat you. Ephesians 6, 18 Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. 
with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for what? For the saints. So this is powerful. Watch this now. This is intercessory prayer. We're called not, so because see, you, you might be sitting in here and you might say, Pastor Tim, I'm, I'm doing all right today. I'm fine. Boy, the sun is shining over my life and over my kids. Well, thank God for that. But you know what? Someone sitting next to you in the, in the row today might be going through a storm. And your row and, and your, your, your honor of sitting with people maybe in your row or here today is what? To pray for them. We can pray for one another when we're in trouble. God, I've prayed for a lot of kids. I've prayed for a lot of teenagers. I've prayed for a lot of people. And you have too. That's what we're to do. We're to what? Pray to the Lord, not just for ourselves, but for one another. And God will answer that prayer. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Amen. Because here's the thing. God will, God will answer your prayer when they're in trouble. And then they'll come out of the trouble. And then you might go right into the trouble. And then they'll pray for you. We pray for, it's a mutual intercessory ministry that we have. Action step number four is be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Ephesians 6, 10 says, Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. We need to claim our strength. We need to claim our position in God. Amen? And be strong in the Lord. We don't, we don't need to back down from our, from our foe, from our enemy. He's defeated. He's defeated. Psalm 147, verse 5 says, Great is our Lord and mighty in power. We serve a great God. We need, to, matter of fact, you know what? We need to magnify our God and minimize our, our, our trials. Regardless of how big the storm, the trial, the tribulation is in your life, you need to, whatever you fix your mind on, whatever you magnify is going to grow. And we need to magnify our God. We need to magnify God in each and every one of, uh, of our lives. Acts 1 verse 8. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit, what? Comes upon you. We have power, what? To be strong in the Lord. Luke 10, 19 says, behold, I've given you power to trample upon snakes and scorpions. Those, those, are, those are the enemy. That's the devil and the demons. And to overcome all the power of the enemy and nothing will by any means harm you. Boy, that's a promise right there. See, we've been given power. We've been given authority in the name of Jesus. When our children or teenagers are troubled, to stand in the gap and to take authority over that and to be strong in the Lord and who, uh, and who we are in Him. Actually, step number five is very close to that, and that's to stand strong. Stand strong. Ephesians 6 says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. In other words, don't back down. Don't run away from the devil. So when the day of evil comes, did you notice it didn't say if there? It said when. When the day of evil comes. When the enemy comes in. When your family's attacked. When your marriage is attacked. When your finances are attacked. When your children go crazy and your relatives go cuckoo. It's a, it's a matter of when. It's not a matter of if. Some of us have lived long enough to know what we're talking about. When the day of evil comes, you may be able to what? Stand your ground. Dig your heels in. And after you've done everything to stand, stand. Stand firm. Stand firm what? In the Lord and in the power of His might. And, all, and here's the thing I've learned. All power and authority will come up, come up behind you. Romans 8, 31 says this. If God be for us, who could be against us? Isn't that wonderful? If God be for you and the whole world is against you, you're going to come out the victor. You're going to come out the champion. You're going to come out smelling like a rose. I don't care what this world can bring you or your children. Stand strong in the Lord. And you know what I think so many times? The devil and the enemy defeats us because it comes in like a flood and we don't stand. If we just stand, if we would just take our stand, we would, we would see, I think, victory a lot quicker. Uh, action step number six is submit. Submit yourselves to the Lord. James 5, 7 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Come near to God and He will what? Come near to you. I love it. Well, pastor, I don't feel God. Well, when was the last time you prayed? When was the last time you read the Word? When was the last time you went to church? Well, I went to church in, in, in 1994. Well, th there might be a reason why you, why you don't sense the presence and power of God or see victory in your life. You, are you with me? 
Because you're not submitted to the Lord. You're not seeking Him. He, he wants to be sought. And the promise is this. If you'll seek, you'll find. Let me say that again. If you'll seek, you'll find. He, he wants to be found by you. He wants you to experience it. But you've got to what? You've got to submit yourself. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. Action step number seven is resist the devil. Resist him. James 5, 7, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Just take your stand and resist him. Say, this is not going to happen. This is not going to happen, devil. And you need to address him. He's, you're not going to see him. He's not going to, you know, stand in your bedroom or your child's bedroom. You just need, but he's there. You need to resist him. And here's the thing. He'll flee from you. He'll flee from you. Why? Because you're standing not in your own power. You're standing in the power and authority of, of Jesus' name. Actually, step number eight is rebuke the devil. Don't just resist the devil, rebuke the devil. Matthew 17, 18. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy. Notice that we're going to get to this here in just a little bit. A child. Troubled children is the message today. And the child was healed from that moment. What brought the healing in that troubled child's life was Jesus rebuked the devil. How, how quick I think God would come to, to our children's side if we just sometimes as parents, or well not sometimes, all the time, rebuke the devil. Rebuke it, whatever it is. Whatever the symptom is, whatever the cause is, just rebuke it and, it, and it's going to go. And it's gonna, it has to go. There's no, there's no choice. Uh, action step number nine is reject the devil. So you re resist the devil, rebuke the devil. Re re Rebuke the devil. Number nine, reject the devil. Ephesians 4, 27. Do not give the devil a foothold. Matthew 4, 10. Jesus said, away from me, Satan. I think too many times we just, what? We accept whatever the devil brings upon us. We accept negative thinking. We accept sickness. We accept disease. We accept depression, Right? We accept strife. We accept rebellion. We accept craziness. That's, that's all, that's the attack. And all we have to do is what? Reject it. This is not happening here. It might happen across the street. It might happen on the other side of the world. But it's not happening in this house. And it's not happening in my family. You got to reject the devil, right? And, uh, and you'll, you'll have the victory. Action step number 10. Matthew 10, 11, excuse me, 10 verse 1 said, Jesus called his disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out demons and to heal every disease and sickness. Mark 16, 17 says, In my name they, that's disciples today, will drive out, what? Demons. So we don't just resist, rebuke, reject. We drive them out. Think about this. Let, let's, let's use an illustration. If you were in your house with your family and a thief came in to rob your house, what would you do? Here's the first thing you'd do. You'd resist him. Secondly, you'd rebuke him. And thirdly, you'd reject him. But you know what? He still might be standing there. What do you got to do? You got to drive him out. You got to get up and, and say, let, we're, we're, let me escort you out of my house. Right? Right? Well, the devil's a thief and he's a robber. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy us. And you know what we need to do every once in a while? We need to just drive them out. Drive them out. And you know one of the things I've, I've found that drives them out is, uh, is, is, is resisting, rebuking, and rejecting. But praise. Just start praising God. Just start going to praying to God. Start calling upon God. And you know what? He, he, can't, he can't stand it. He leaves. And that's one way we drive the, drive the enemy out. Drive the enemy out. Action step number 11. What do you do when, you're, when your child, and in particular your son, is troubled? Well, here it is. Action step number 11. Bring your son to the Lord. This is an amazing, amazing narrative. I want to read it to you from Mark 9. Uh, it talks about a father. Now picture this. Please don't just, don't just read it with me. Picture this scene. A father is bringing a troubled, his troubled son to the Lord. Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed or troubled by an evil spirit that has robbed him of speech, so the boy can't talk. Whenever it seizes him, that's an evil spirit, that's the enemy, it throws him to the ground. He, that's the boy, foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. 
I asked your disciples to drive out the evil spirit, but they could not. So he couldn't get to Jesus, so he said, hey, there's some disciples over here. Would you help my child? He's troubled. He's vexed. He's agitated. Amen? And they couldn't help him. Jesus says, oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? And then Jesus says, I love this, bring the boy to me. Isn't that good news? What do you do when your son is troubled? Bring the boy to Jesus. So they brought him, the boy, to Jesus. When the evil spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. We would call that today an epileptic uh, fit. All right, epilepsy. <clears throat> Convulsions. He, the boy, fell to the ground, rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he, the child, been like this? From childhood, the father answered. It, that's the evil spirit, has often, listen to this now. It, the evil spirit, has often thrown him, the child, into fire. Or water in order to what? To kill him. See, this is, we have a real enemy. Our children have a real enemy, amen? This enemy was trying to get this child and throwing him into the fire, throwing him in the water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us, says the Father. And Jesus says, if you can, everything is possible for what? For him who believes. Everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. He said, you deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And the evil spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. And the boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. Completely whole, completely delivered, completely healed. Why? Because the father had enough faith, didn't have much faith, he had enough faith to bring his child. He said, listen, I don't know what, I, I'm powerless, I don't know what to do. I'm going to take my child, I'm going to take my baby to Jesus. And Jesus helped him. Jesus helped him. Action step number 12, that's the son. What do you do when you've got a troubled daughter? Well, you bring your daughter to the Lord. Mark 7 says, Jesus entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence a secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about Jesus, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit, troubled, and came fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syria, Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive out the demon out of her daughter. Jesus said to her, first let the children eat all they want. Jesus told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then Jesus told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home and found her child lying on the bed, and the demon, what, had gone. Isn't that wonderful? So we have two illustrations, a father that brought his son, a mother that came, didn't have the daughter with her, but came on behalf of her daughter, came to the Lord and asked God what? To help them, to, to, to save, to heal, to deliver, to set their child free. And what's the point of this? The point is this, is that Jesus never refused them. Jesus didn't turn, now he said, now don't be confused with this narrative here in, uh, in Mark 7, uh, all right? Jesus said, it's, I'm sent to the, to, the, to the house of Israel first. And the dogs there is a, is a metaphor and a, a cultural nickname for the Gentiles. All right, we're not talking about, she's not, he's, he's not calling this woman a dog. So husbands don't go home and call your wife a dog. All right, all right. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a metaphor, it's a nickname that they use for the, for the Gentiles, okay? So he's, he's saying, listen, I've come to give the bread, the healing bread to the children. And this woman, she's a smart mama. She's coming desperate, right, for her child. And she says, oh, yes, Lord, you're right. But even the dogs underneath the table get the crumbs from the children's bread because y'all know stuff about children. They, they can't keep all the food on the plate. <laughs> the crumbs will get on the floor. And the dogs come and eat, amen? For those of you that have dogs, you've got clean floors. 
right? Because the dog will come and lick up the lick up the crumbs. Well, that's what she's saying. And, and Jesus is amazed by her answer. He says, "Boy, this is this woman's all right. She's she's getting it." And she said, "All right." And Jesus says, "I'll answer your prayer." And she wasn't even in covenant. Are you with me? She wasn't even saved. But she'd heard of Jesus and said, boy, I'm willing to do anything. And she came to him. And here is the blessed point again, is Jesus never turned a parent down. Jesus never turned anyone away that came to him. Now, who is the body of Christ today in the earth? It's the church. It's the church. And you know what the church should be? It's not just, a, you know, a, a, a country club for the saints. The church is a hospital for hurting broken people. When they can, they sh people should be coming into the church, and not just this church, every church around the world with hurting and broken, troubled children and teenagers and saying to Jesus through the church, help me. And you know what we do? We never turn one away. We're, we're the hands and the feet and the, and the instrument of, and we are literally the physical representation of Jesus Christ in the earth today. That's who we are. We're filled with his spirit. We're, we're anointed with his power, amen? To what? To do exactly what Jesus did. And Jesus healed, delivered, set free every troubled child, every troubled teenager. In other words, there's hope, mom. There's hope, dad, for your child, regardless of what your child is going through. And I want to close with this. Not only did Jesus deliver them, Jesus blessed the children. Jesus loved kids. Let me say that again, because I don't know that there's ever, I've never heard a pastor say that. So you're going to hear your pastor say that today. Jesus loves children. He loved children. Jesus never turned away or refused to embrace or bless a child in his ministry. Jesus always welcomed warmly the youngest among the crowds to come to him. Why? Because he wanted to bless them. Jesus wanted to bless the children with his grace, his favor, and his love and acceptance. And here's the good news about Jesus. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because Jesus loved children 2,000 years ago, we know that Jesus loves kids still today. And he's going to love kids tomorrow. Because Jesus loved teenagers 2,000 years ago, we know Jesus loved teenagers today, and he will tomorrow. Jesus wants to bless children today through the local church and through Christian parents. Mark 10, 13 through 16, I close with this. It says these words, people were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, bless them. But the disciples, watch this now, the disciples rebuked them. Isn't that interesting? The disciples were like his bodyguards and he said, I don't need bodyguards, just... You know, he was, he, they, were, they were saying, hey, don't, don't, these little kids, don't bother Jesus. He's got, he's got bigger, bigger uh, problems to fix. And notice what Jesus did. When Jesus saw this, please watch this. When Jesus saw this, that the disciples were rebuking the children, he was indignant. That's a nice way of saying not happy, all right? Jesus was not pleased by their, by their, uh, by their rebuke of the children. Jesus said to them, the disciples, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. What does that mean? Please listen to this. The kingdom of God is his righteousness, his promises, his goodness and grace. In other words, Jesus is saying, please listen. Jesus is saying, my promises aren't just for the adults. My salvation isn't for the adults only. My healing isn't for the adults only. My deliverance isn't for the adults only. My baptism in the Holy Spirit isn't only for adults. It's for who? It's for the children as well. That's what that means. The kingdom of God isn't just for you adults. It's for the kids. In other words, kids, you don't have to grow up to get saved. You don't have to grow up and wait till you're 25 to pray. You don't have to wait till you're 32 to serve God. Jesus said the kingdom of God is what? It belongs to the children as much as it belongs to the adults. That's good news. I tell you the truth, Jesus says, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And then what did he do? Verse 16, Jesus took the children in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great? So saints, here's what we should be doing as a church. When we see little kids coming in 
Don't rebuke them. Don't, don't turn them down. Don't in, put your hands on them. Hug them. Love them. Bless them. Encourage them to praise God. Encourage them to clap their hands. Encourage them to pray. Encourage them to read the word. Encourage them to come to the Lord. Amen? And encourage them to witness for Jesus. My third grade Sunday school teacher told us to do that. You know what? I didn't know anything better, so I went out and did it. Monday morning, I sat all my friends down. True story. <laughs> Elementary school playground, I said, listen, y'all going to get saved. And I, I went to preach it to them. I said, you're going to hell. <laughs> I did. I did. I true story. I didn't know any better. I just started preaching to kids. I started inviting my friends to church. And you know what? They started coming. I started inviting my, my when I was in the youth group, I started inviting my, my friends to church. And they started coming. I said, let's go on a mission trip. They go. Right? So it's not just for us adults. Amen? Our children can do it. Matter of fact, they're, they're great. They're, and, and little kids will respond a lot quicker than adults uh, to it. So, don't, so let's bless the children. Let's, uh, let's not turn them away. And I want to close with that. Let's just bow our heads right now. Can we do that? And let's just pray for our children today. Let's pray for our teenagers and ask God to bless them, deliver them, and set them free. Let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that you came to destroy the works of the devil, not only in our lives as adults, but in the lives of our teenagers and the lives of our children. And Satan, we rebuke you, we reject you, and resist you right now in Jesus' name. And we command you to get your hands off of our children. We command you to get your hands off of our teenagers. Loose them now and let them go. And we speak the blessing of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the blessing of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, in upon every one of our children and upon er, in every one of our teenagers. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen, amen.